Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, I'm going to be covering the difference between reversible and irreversible cell injury, apoptosis, and necrosis. This is the second video in my section covering cell injury and cancer, so I hope you check out the rest of these when you're done with this one. You can see at the top right corner that I give the difference between reversible and irreversible cell injury a high yield rating of 8. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a rating scale from 0 to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how likely you are to see certain topics on the Step 1 exam. And if you'd like to learn more about the high yield rating or how it's calculated, you can head here to my website. Reversible cellular injury is harm done to cells that can be undone once the the stress on the cell is removed. Irreversible cellular injury is cell death via apoptosis or necrosis, which is obviously permanent. There's no zombie cells. Severe or prolonged reversible cellular injury will eventually lead to irreversible cell injury. Each type of cell injury has some cellular hallmarks which show up often in the question stem. For reversible cellular injury, this is going to be decreased ATP in the cell and cellular swelling. And for irreversible cellular injury, it's going to be membrane damage and the results of that membrane damage. So we can dive a little deeper into the reversible cell injury. You're going to have a decrease in ATP, which leads to less activity of the sodium potassium pump in that cell which leads to a buildup of sodium in that cell. And due to osmotic forces, water is going to flow into the cell to balance out that sodium, which leads to the cellular swelling. In most questions, this is going to be related to some sort of ischemia. That's what's going to trigger the low ATP. You're not going to be getting enough blood to those cells, which means they're not going to have enough energy in the form of ATP. And that's what's going to start this cascade going. Now we can go into irreversible cellular injury, which is a little bit more complicated. And depending on the size screen you're watching on or how good your internet is, this may be a little bit tough to read. But if you go to my website and the page for apoptosis and necrosis, I'll post a higher resolution photo of this if you're having trouble reading this. So as I mentioned, membrane damage is the hallmark of irreversible cellular injury. And you're gonna have this membrane damage primarily to three different membranes. First, you're gonna have the lysosomal membrane damage, which would obviously cause a lot of problems because the lysosome has a lot of enzymes that degrade things. And when those enzymes spill out of the lysosome into the rest of the cell, you're gonna have problems because a lot of organelles and proteins that shouldn't be degraded are going to be degraded. That's going to lead to enzymatic degradation of the cell, which is similar to necrosis. You're also going to have damage to the outer cell membrane, which is going to lead to increased calcium leaking into the cell. Calcium then goes on to activate certain proteases and other degradative enzymes, so that's again going to lead to enzymatic degradation of the cell. We're also going to have membrane damage to the mitochondria and that's going to lead to cytochrome c leaking out and cytochrome c is an enzyme involved in oxidative phosphorylation so it makes sense that it would be in the mitochondria the cytochrome c in the cytosol goes on to activate caspases as well as the calcium in the cell that we talked about earlier being able to activate caspases as well so calcium and cytochrome c lead to activation of caspases. And when caspases are activated, it triggers apoptosis. Or Now I could talk a little bit more in depth about apoptosis and necrosis. Apoptosis is going to be programmed, or it's going to be the cell realizing that it should undergo apoptosis in doing so. Well, necrosis is due to damage or trauma of some sort. Intrinsic would be when the cell decides to die because if it's a normal part of physiology or development or the cell is no longer needed. In the same way, the cell can decide to die because it is damaged beyond repair. 
extrinsic triggers for cell death would be when the cell is sort of told to die by the environment or another cell or some other signal. Apoptosis can be intrinsically or extrinsically triggered, while necrosis can only be extrinsically triggered. Apoptosis can be pathologic in disease or be physiologic in certain types of development or normal physiology, while necrosis is only pathologic. Apoptosis in involves individual cells undergoing cell death, while necrosis generally includes large areas of many cells dying all at the same time. Apoptosis requires ATP as energy, while necrosis does not. Apoptosis does not have any inflammation resulting from the cell death, but necrosis does have inflammation that's caused. During apoptosis, the cell components are packaged into apoptotic bodies and consumed by phagocytes. While in necrosis, the cellular contents spill out of the cell, the cell kind of explodes, and you end up with this cellular components leaking out everywhere. Some intrinsic triggers for apoptosis would be a decrease in growth factors, P53 tumor suppressors, or cellular damage. And all of these signals let the cell know that it should decide to undergo cell death. Extrinsic triggers for apoptosis would be things like the fast ligand or tumor necrosis factor. And when we're talking about fast ligand, we're usually referring to CD8 cytotoxic T cells. And either way things are activated, you're going to have caspases be activated, which is then going to set off the cascade of apoptosis. Here's a picture of apoptosis showing the apoptotic bodies blebbing off and then being consumed by phagocytes. Unlike necrosis, apoptosis can sometimes be good or physiologic. It can be a normal part of development. Problems with apoptosis only arise when there's too much apoptosis or apoptosis is being triggered by a pathologic cause. Here are some examples of apoptosis which would be considered good. You have the separation of the fingers in embryos, so you're having the webbing in between the fingers disappear. You've got clonal deletion of lymphocytes. You have C cytotoxic CD8 T cells destroying infected cells. Menstruation has certain types of apoptosis, and atrophy would be another type of apoptosis. However, there's also going to be situations where there's too much apoptosis, and this can lead to tissue damage and plays a role in many degenerative diseases. At the same time, not having enough apoptosis would also be an issue. This can play a role in certain cancer formations, autoimmune diseases, and lead to susceptibility to infection. Now we can switch gears and start talking about different types of necrosis because there are pretty distinct types that are important for step one. The first one we're going to cover is coagulative necrosis. And I think of this as being the default necrosis. And in coagulative necrosis, cells keep their shape but lose their nucleus. Here is a picture of coagulative necrosis. You can still see certain outlines of cells, but you'll notice the darker nucleus is missing from most of these cells. They can also show you gross anatomy pictures on the step one, and in these cases, this usually looks like a pale, wedged-shaped area on the organ. And here would be an example of that. This lighter yellow portion would be the area that's undergoing necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis is complete enzymatic degradation of the tissue. It basically becomes a liquid. And the two most important examples of this would be in the brain with something like a stroke and inside abscesses, which is going to form pus. And here would be an example of a cavity that's formed as a result of liquefactive necrosis. The tissue in this circular area was turned into liquid and then over time, it was absorbed or degraded by phagocytes, and what you're left with is this empty cavity in the brain. Caseous necrosis can be remembered by rem 
remembering that caseus is the Latin term for cheese, and this necrosis does result in sort of a cheese-like type consistency. And I think of it as being a mix between coagulative and liquefactive. It's not quite liquid, it's not quite solid, it's somewhere in the middle there. And the two most important examples of when this is going to happen is going to be during tuberculosis and in the inside of granulomas. Here is a picture of a granuloma, and you'll see over here you've got sort of liquefactive type mix with coagulative necrosis, and then on the outside you've got inflammatory cells. Fibrinoid necrosis is when proteins from the blood leak into damaged vessel walls, and this is seen in pictures with a pink or red color in the vessel wall itself. Here's an example of that. You can see this pink color is in the vessel wall. And this is going to be most important or most commonly seen in step one questions with certain types of vasculitis and in malignant hypertension. Fat necrosis is a type of saponification, which is the process of making soaps. You are going to have a mixture of the calcium from the necrotic cells that's spilling out its cell contents with the fat from the surrounding tissue, which is going to cause a white, chalky, soap-like formation. And this is most often seen in step one questions in pancreatitis, because there's going to be peripancreatic fat, and trauma to the breast. Gangrenous necrosis is a type of necrosis seen in peripheral tissues, like the toes or parts of the distal GI system as a result of ischemia or infection, like Clostridium perfringens. And this is often going to be seen in diabetics and smokers. An example of a smoker having gangrenous necrosis would be Berger's vasculitis. And in a lot of cases, gangrenous necrosis at the toes would lead to amputation because necrosis cannot be reversed. And I'll show you a picture here for a second, but I do want to warn you, it's a little graphic, so if you're eating or something, you may want to avert your eyes. But here would be a picture of gangrenous necrosis in the toes.